Okay, hello chess players. Today we're going to be taking a look at this endgame. Uh, this endgame is actually very complicated, and it's something that you're going to have to calculate through and have to try to figure it out. And in this video, I'm going to walk you through how you calculate through an endgame like this, how you figure out an endgame like this if you end up having to play this over the board, and what exactly you need to do to play these positions correctly. Anyways, if you like content like this and want to see more of it, please hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So, at first glance, this looks like a Rook and Pawn endgame. Uh, it's not. It's a rook versus pawns endgame. Uh, black has a rook, white does not. White instead has a very dangerous pass pawn that is very far up the board. That at this point is so far up the board, black will have to sacrifice uh, for this pawn. Now that being said, you might say, well, if the pawn is so far up the board I have to sacrifice for it, why not just sacrifice for it right away? Why not play rook takes h6? Well, we could. Um, and if we play rook takes h6, after king takes h6, this king is very, very close to this pawn on f5, and he's going to win it. And I'm going to get more into that in a second. So this would actually be a losing endgame for black. So the next question is, okay, fine. If that's the case, why don't I just sacrifice for that pawn on a different square? Why don't I just play something like rook b7? Just move my rook out of the way temporarily. Uh, because, of course, you'll, you'll note the king isn't close enough to save. I can't save my rook. I can't play rook king f8. And then you'll take my rook. So why not just move this rook away? Why not play something like rook b7, and then when the pawn moves to h7, I'm just going to play rook takes h7, and now king takes rook. Well, again, the white king will actually win this pawn. And the fact that you can get opposition in this position does not matter. So at this point, what you're calculating is you're calculating king and pawn endgames. And that's the first thing you have to recognize when this position starts, is essentially what you're calculating here is not even a rook and pawn endgame, or even a rook versus pawns endgame, it's a king and pawn endgame, because eventually this rook will have to sacrifice for the h-pawn. It's just a question of where it's going to do that sacrificing. What square is everything going to be on when it sacrifices? And then you have to calculate the king and pawn endgame from there. And you have to figure out if you're winning that king and pawn endgame, if you're drawing that king and pawn endgame, or if you're losing that king and pawn endgame. So after you play a move like rook to b7, h7, rook takes h7, king h7, the king on h7 will still win that pawn on f5. Why? Because the king will get to the zone of that pawn. So king f7 getting the opposition doesn't help. King h6, king f6, king h5, the king is now in the zone of that pawn, and that essentially means that this white king will win that pawn no matter what black does or no matter what move order black picks to try to defend it. So even if you know black plays king e6, we're going to have king g5, the king will be forced away from the defense of that pawn and we lose, but if we choose a different move order, we still lose. For example, king f7, king g5, king e6, king g6, we still get kicked away from the pawn and we lose. That's because the king was in the zone. That's the three squares to the left or to the right of the pawn. And in the case of this f-pawn, these two squares are the zone of the pawn. When the white king captured the rook on h7, he was automatically going to get to the zone of the f5-pawn, and there was nothing we could do to stop it. So all those king and pawn endgames are going to be absolutely lost. So when we come back, we need to figure out what to do. So another thing that we can calculate is, okay, if moving the rook, you know, left and right doesn't work, if capturing the pawn doesn't work, what about moving the king? So if we haven't tried that yet, let's work it out in our head. We could play king f8. King f 8s a reasonable attempt. And then we would have king h7, and then we would have king f7, and that would lock the white king in there. And of course, certainly white doesn't want to just hang his pawns with d5 or b3, because we could take them. So he would be forced to move back and forth. He would play king h8, king f8, king h7, king f7, draw. This would be equality, because both the white king and the black king can just continually move back and forth. But what is interesting to note is if after, say, king f7, and then we have king h8, king f8, if white were to be a nice guy and play pawn on h6 to h7, and then we play king f7, then white would be forced to move his pawns and we would win. And that's something that you need to keep in mind when you're looking for the right move in this initial starting position. Because, of course, the right move at this point hopefully should be obvious, and it's definitely the very next move that you should calculate. The right move, pause the video and see if you see it, is rook h8. The point of rook h8 is when the king makes his final capture, we want him to capture that rook on the h8 square. And we want to force white to go to that h8 square. So white has a couple of different replies here. He could play the, you know, advance. He could play pawn to h7. And and again, we shouldn't be playing rook takes h7. Now, black has a couple of different ways he can play it. He can just play king f8 and just lock the white king out. And that's 
certainly a very boring approach to eventually winning this position. It is also possible to play king e7 here. And it's going to transpose uh, into the other line. Basically, the idea is we want the king to go to g7, and then we want to play the king back to e8, and then we're going to have, for example, king h8, king f7 is going to be winning. We could do something like this. Um, so this is kind of entertaining. You know, king, king e7 is, is a very real possibility. As long as we're locking that king into, you know, as long as we're locking that king into the corner, uh, uh, essentially, as long as we're locking the king into the corner, like if he plays king h8, we play king f7, uh, we're still winning this position. But it, it can transpose into this other line. And, and like I said, the other possibility is just, you know, king f8, we, we lock him out, we win easy. So what's the other possibility after rook h8? Well, they could, of course, play king g7, and they could just threaten to play king takes rook. And, of course, if they play king takes rook and we lock in the king with king f7, king f8, that's just a draw as long as they have two squares that they can shuffle their king back and forth between, as long as they can shuffle their king back and forth between uh, both these two squares, it's going to be a draw. We're not going to win. So, again, we have king g7. What should we play next? Well, if just moving our king is going to lead to a draw with king takes rook, and, of course, rook takes pawn, it's going to lead to a loss because the king's in the zone of the f-pawn, we should move our rook again. We should play rook f8. And this is going to force a king move. The reason it forced a king move is, let's say we have something like king g6. Now we can play king e7, and then we have something like king g7. Now we can play rook b8. Now we have time to actually do some other stuff in this position uh, before, you know, white makes progress. You know, if white plays something like king g6, we actually have time to play a move like king f8, and then pawn h7, king, king back to e7. And we're going to actually end up in the same exact situation. If this king comes back to g7, we're actually going to play the next move, which is going to be rook h8. But we could have achieved that through this other move order, like rook f8, h7. This is the main idea that you have to see. Pause the video, see if you can find it. Rook h8. Because we want the king to capture that rook on the h8 square. And again, if the king moves backwards, you know, if king g6, we have king f8, we, we lock the king out, everything is fine. But we really just want the king to capture that rook on the h8 square. So we're going to have king takes h8, king f7, and now we win. So it's all just kind of revolving around making the king capture the rook when it's stalemate creating this stalemate scenario where all of a sudden a white has to push pawns and we take them and then he's still got one pawn that needs to run and we make a queen and then we have mate. So again, this is as complicated this endgame looks, as many lines as it looks like are possible and as many different deviations. If you start working your way through the calculations and you eliminate all the lines that don't work, you get left with the one line that does. And as soon as you find the idea of sacrificing your rook on the h8 square and getting this stalemate trick, then you can start making every single line work, and you can start playing for a win with black, and you can actually achieve that win. Uh, so anyways, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess. I hope you can use some of these ideas in your own games. Uh, thank you very much for watching.